This is supernatural music. This is music of the cosmos. This music to me has the ultimate innerness, hyper-personal. It transports you to another realm of time and space altogether. Well, hi there, everyone. It's me, Penny. Welcome back to my practice room. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the E major, Prelude and Fugue, number nine, from volume two of The Well-Tempered Clavier by J.S. Bach published in 1744. And uh, I know many of us have a special place in our heart for this particular fugue. And uh, I've been talking lately about voicing and specifically singing as I play so that you can hear the parts that I'm bringing out. Whether it's a three voice piece or a four voice piece, however many voices there are, I love to jump around. I think there was a pop song in the 90s called Jump Around, Jump Around. That's what I like to do when I'm voicing. And I also like to blend. I like to scoot from, from maybe a soprano to a tenor, maybe to a bass, then to an alto, and then dip, dip up and down to the side all over the place to keep the ears interested and engaged. And of course this music is special because all of the voices are equal. Soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. It's not like one of them has this, the aria, the, the beautiful melody, and everyone else is, you know, in the background, strumming the chord kind of thing. No, all of the voices are equal. And the voices in Bach's music, to me anyway, are like people. They're like little spirits that they've been <laughs> trying to avoid getting dusty on the page for all these 300 years. <laughs> or, or 270-some years in the case of Volume 2 here. Um, but they're, they're just crying to be heard and, and to be given breath and life to. And, I, and it's, it's just, I just my, my imagination loves to think about these voices as little spirits, little, I don't know, fairies, <laughs> whatever you want to call them. So I'm just going to get in here and uh, just sing as I play and call out some of the things that I'm listening for. Uh, so starting with this prelude, this is number nine, E major. We get this nice uh, tonic in the bass to start. And in the top, we get uh, actually two voices, um, like a soprano and an alto, two, two singers. Um, the top voice. and this is Bach's trademark style of course and it's the soprano that that uh, goes to bat first <laughs> to use a baseball reference and then the alto alto it's like little echoes and that is all being executed by one hand your right hand. <laughs> and as I was saying in the C major prelude and fugue from this same volume, volume two, that one, which is uh, after the first three or so bars becomes a four part texture. And uh, again, two voices in one hand. It's crucial to distinguish those two voices in that same hand so that you give a different tone color to your top and to your to your upper uh, to your to your alto because if you don't they sound very the word I like to use is static just like flat and bland so here's here's how it sounds if I play my soprano my alto the same <laughs> It sounds like one voice that's covering a lot of ground.
but that's not how it's written. He's got the stems going up for the soprano and the stems going down for the alto. Treat them as people, as spirits, fairies, whatever you want. So that means you have to choose which one you want to bring out. And uh, because this is the beginning of the piece and it's the soprano that kicks things off, I'm going to give her the spotlight. And my alto is going to be a little bit more muted and pastel in the background. And the way to practice this is simply very slowly and singing is helpful. So I'm going to bring out my soprano here and give less to the alto. Less to the alto. So we hear rather than both the same. Oh, it's just such a letdown, but which had been parked on the tonic there for two bars. And then maybe the bass. Here we are in the dominant. We got B, it's the dominant of E major. And now we get uh, another similar little rap, trip around the track, as they say. Um, but this time, the middle voice is initiating, <laughs> going to bat first, followed by the soprano. So here I'm going to give my alto the spotlight, and I'm going to pull back, make more muted and pastel my soprano. So here's the alto. to the middle of the, of the instrument, it's not necessarily that those two voices are always played by the right hand. Sometimes they're, they're shared by the hands, but you still want to give them a different tone color. Um, so that's the voice I want to hear, and less on this soprano. So here it is with the spotlight on my alto and less sound for the soprano. Alto. Less on your soprano. And then maybe the bass. And that to me is kind of assertive. It's a little cadential moment there, that F sharp major to B. This is measure eight. Back to our alto. A little answer there in the soprano. And then the, the bass gets uh, kind of hungry for some spotlight. Eh? 
Um, Bach's music, to me, so much of it anyway, uh, maybe not the fugue of this one or the prelude of the C major one and uh, many other pieces for that matter, but so much of his music, to me, is has a motoric quality, and I mean that in the best way. Not that it's the same over and over again and repetitive and boring and we can just like go on automatic pilot, no, but that there's there's constant um, there's there's repetition of little sequences and little patterns, which to me is uh, such a product of an of an era in which the clock had had become a a, a, pic, a fixture of of life in the home um, versus music from centuries earlier, um, you know the the early medieval Gregorian chants where where you know those are those are not head bobbing pieces those are not toe tappers <laughs> you know um, I always think about music in relation to when the the clock started being used commonly and um, I have the date written down somewhere I'll have to f dig that out but uh, the clock was around <laughs> I'm sure Bach had one uh, in his house and um, th these these many of these passages have such a clock-like um, regularity, and this is one of them. Maybe a little bit of a fast clock there, but you'll get the idea. And so I like to juxtapose moments of that with the more um, clockless, <laughs> timeless, uh, read transcendental, open spaciousness, and that's what we had going on in this C major prelude and fugue. The prelude was very clockless, <laughs> very transcendental and full of space, and the way I chose to interpret the fugue was very much driven and, and with a reliable pulse and clock-like, if you want to call it that. Um, but this is such a fun little moment, and of course it's all dominant pedal in the left hand. This B measure 18 through 20. And I, even though there's other stuff going on, the soprano has... Ooh, that G natural. Oh, that's a bit of a surprise. That's fun. Um, but even though that's going on as well, the alto... Oh, those little, little tied notes are quite uh, enticing. <coughs> but despite all that activity in the top, uh, two voices, what I'm listening for is that dominant uh, pedal tone in the bottom, the B. Which is so delicious there. If you sing that B through those three bars and then when you hear the G natural, whoo, in measure 20, ah, this is chills. <laughs> stop they keep going and there's that G natural again this time in the bass or rather uh, tenor it's become four part all of a sudden Is, is unique because um, it has re a repeat sign halfway through as well as at the end so you play both sections twice um, and when I take the repeats um, I basically do the opposite um, in those places so uh, where the soprano went to bat first and I gave her the spotlight and less to the alto I'll give I'll do the opposite. <laughs> so less for the soprano and more to the alto. And some of the, the places in between, I'll, I'll maybe do the same kind of things I was in the first time, but with some occasional different notes peeking through. And it's different every time, all governed by the idea of good blending and touching each voice equally. Um, you know those, uh, the, old, the Ed Sullivan show, we, I used to watch that, I mean, that, that's way before my time. But reruns, they used to have it on TV, 
and on a Sunday and uh, I would watch it and there was the, the, the guy who would come out with the spinning plates, you know, four plates and the, they're spinning and you got to keep them going and not have them drop and break. Well, I think that's a wonderful analogy for playing Bach. <laughs> four plates, four voices, right? <laughs> or three, you know. But still, the, the, the goal is the same. You, you got to, in order to avoid dropping those plates and having them crash and break, you got to tend to them equally. You know, you got to spin one. Oh, this one needs a spin. This one needs a spin, you know. And it's like that with the voicing. You can't just have a, well, you can if you, if you want. Um, but I, I just can't stand top-heavy playing or bottom-heavy playing where all you hear, the only voice that has a spotlight is the soprano or the only voice that has a spotlight is the bass or just the outer voices. I think it's so fresh and, and also equitable and fair, <laughs> you know, from a social standpoint to give these voices their fair due, their, their, to hear them equally. Um, and that's one of the things I love about Bach's music. Certainly what I love most is this, is that it allows me um, to have tr a kind of transcendental experience, a kind of escapism through the, the particular pieces where there is a, a spacious quality and almost clockless quality as I've talked about. But then at the same time I can kind of flex my piano muscles and <clears throat> rev my engine in some very clock-like ma um, machine or muscle car kind of giddy up and go um, pulsating uh, energy which is just so exciting. I don't like roller coasters or any kind of fast rides but I love cars. I know nothing about how they work but I love them. I love to look at them. And I love the idea of, you know, power and being able to accelerate and to be able to have that power too. And uh, there's so many places in Bach where, where we need that power to just get that plane off the runway. But yet there are so many places where it's just time stands still and you're, you're in a transcendental space. This music takes you to a, an otherworldly place. And I can only get to that place that transcendental state, when I am giving equal attention to the voices. Uh, so that's that's what I'm that's that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, getting into the B section here, this uh, starts in the dominant. We're at measure twenty-five. Um, so it starts the same way uh, with this uh, long note in the bass, and as at the beginning, the soprano is the leader. She starts things off. I shouldn't say she, because, you know, I don't want to tie people into uh, specific roles gender-wise here. But the top voice starts things off here. And then the alto. This, this B section, let's call it, has some, some added chromaticism here, that B sharp, which is so juicy. Um, but let's hear, let's hear what I'm doing here. I'm bringing out the soprano, because this person, he or she, is getting things rolling. And then like a shadow in the middle voice. sharp in the bass. it's the soprano that has more activity. Um, missed a note there, sorry. But I don't know, I just find this tenor. Sort of like the, 
the sage old voice, I told you so, whatever, you know, with the wisdom of, of age. And, um, and this is, but I don't want to listen, I just want to play and fly, right? Um, when I go around the second time with the repeats, I'll probably then voice the soprano more and give less to the, the, the sage um, voice of, of reason in the bottom. But there, that first time through, ha, ah, I love it. of Beethoven actually or Beethoven is reminiscent of this rather let's get the chronology straight here <laughs> Beethoven of course knew this music inside and out as did Chopin many composers to listen for and bring out movement by step and here's a lovely little place uh, 31 to the arrival of 32 it's a cadence in C sharp minor and that right hand is moving stepwise as the bass goes and the alto goes voices. It's, it's not fixed. There's no right or wrong. You try them all out and see what you like. See which one gives you goosebumps and that's the one to go with. What did Wanda Landowska once say? Uh, did Bach write for teachers meetings? <laughs> you know, <laughs> words to live by. So here I'm listening for my uh, that movement by step in the top voice. 31. Yeah. the sound of that C sharp even though it's resting in the end of the bar but I just carry it through because that whole bar bar 32 is really just C sharp minor I'm singing C sharp and then maybe G sharp in the bass thirds in the uh, middle voice at the middle and bottom voice at 34 and 35. Um, you can bring out again anyone you like. Try not to give, make them both exactly the same. Um, I like to voice to the top here so that means hearing the middle voice. Maybe when I take the repeat and go back the second time, I'll bring out the bottom, which would sound like But this time I'm going to bring out the top voice. an orange, one's a brown, one's a green, you know, uh, this kind of thing. Um, I should add too that the way I'm playing it now is completely without pulse <laughs> and regularity of pulse, which as much as I love a spacious performance in certain pieces, um, th this is, th I, when I'm working on voicing, I kind of take pulse and rhythm and just sort of put it in, in a drawer <laughs> temporarily, because I, I can't, if there's something continuously pulsating, um, I can't just stop and smell the flowers, which is what I need to do here. I need to smell the voices with my ears, right? I think a, a big issue with, uh, with so much of this difficult music is, is that people, audiences who perhaps are not that uh, experienced with, with how to listen and what to listen for, 
especially if it's uh, if there's something to watch as well, and they're not just on the radio or a CD. Um, they listen with their eyes, I think. And if they're seeing a lot of, you know, s voluptuous movements of the body and, and striking clothing and all sorts of things, it's a lot to take in. And it's very easy to listen with your eyes. And, uh, you know, that is a big part of it. But really, you've got to try to find a way to, to listen. listen. What was it? Glenn Gould um, said something. I don't have the exact quote in my mind, but something about how he believed, and if anyone could listen well, it was him. And if anyone had an incredible security trap memory that could just retain everything, it was him. And even he used to say something like, um, we're all capable of listening so much more deeply than we realize. And, and I have that in my mind all the time. When I think that I've found all the little voicings that I want to hear, I just like remind myself of those words and then I on the hunt for, for more for more voicings and that. It's just so much fun to pick and choose what you want to bring out. So we left off then, um, yeah, those little feathers in 36 in the middle voice. And I'm distorting the, the pulse just for the sake of taking time to smell the roses with my ears. <laughs> step that's always a good thing in long notes if you can find if you're if you're at a loss um, bring out long notes moving by step so the alto in there at uh, 37 la, la, la. moving notes that are moving by by skip like by third maybe overlap them a little bit or go deeper into the key or something because I just find that a lot of students uh, skim over the keys when there are wider intervals this is just moving by third fifth third right? as opposed to by step it's easier to articulate clearly when you're playing by step, but when the notes get further apart, that's when it starts to sound muddy. So just overlap a little bit and hear the top notes of each of those highest intervals. And that'll give a little bit more definition to the shape. Uh, this is 40. If I play it without overlapping and without careful articulation, hearing the notes, but I'm not listening. Yeah. As opposed to, but, you know, feeling like they're gears in a watch. Yeah, there's a lovely note to, to an apple to pull off the tree. <laughs> oh, you know, there's some apples that have some worm bites in the wormholes and maybe one fell on the ground and is covered in mud but then you see that nice like what the the, the apples that Snow White got oh you can't resist the, the round perfect shiny ones we got one here <laughs> in the middle voice at 41 so coming out of the previous bar oh, oh take a bite of that nice apple Of 
course, I'm distorting the rhythm so you can hear it. But this little... <laughs> One more time, Mr. B. <laughs> you know, he often goes in threes, sometimes fours. Um, have some fun with that. Um, It's three times here, and maybe on the third time, dig in a little bit and get some, some dirt on, under your nails kind of thing. <laughs> you know, hearty. Um, uh, maybe the D sharp. There's another apple to pick, a nice apple. <laughs> in the alto uh, at 45. Uh, brings us now to the fugue. If you want a ticket to transcendental land of sublime beauty and spaciousness, learn this piece. <laughs> uh, there's a few pieces that really do it for me. This is one of them. Um, I think that this piece is, uh, we might say, uh, what, what did Jean Lemoyne wrote uh, an essay about Bach's music. Um, we could quote him here, that Bach is aiming at a supernatural goal. This is supernatural music. This is music of the cosmos. Um, this music to me has the ultimate innerness, hyper-personal. It's, it's, it's just, it just transports you to another realm of time and space altogether. And speaking of time, I, I did reference clocks earlier in this video and uh, I was uh, a little bit lost in my mind as for the, the actual date that the uh, clock, I mean clocks have been have been in existence in some form or another uh, for, for thousands of years, you know, from the sundial and various water clocks and things. Um, but uh, this idea that so much of Bach's music to me has a clock-like quality. If you think of like the uh, the F major invention, the A minor invention, variation one of the Goldbergs. This to me is not supernatural music, transcendental music music of the cosmos. This is, this is music of an age 
um, of inventions and, and mechanical inventions, and that was the era Bach lived in. In the uh, he was born in 1685, so by the time he grew up a little, you know, a little bit. This is into the uh, this is the first half of the 1700s, first half of the 18th century, and clocks were beginning to uh, become common in people's uh, everyday lives. And that is unique. I think that has a, a, a huge in influence on music and rhythm. Um, and I just jotted down some notes here from an article in Scientific American. Uh, this article is from February 2006. It's called A Chronicle of Timekeeping by William J. H. Andrews. And uh, it says that in the, in the 1400s, so the 15th century, uh, there was a growing number of clocks made for domestic use, and then throughout the 16th century they were working to um, fine-tune the pendulum to get it precise. That was in the 16th century. And uh, he says that by the, by the, towards the, the end of the 17th century, there started to be a rise in pocket watches. Um, well, you could hang it from your neck, whatever, wherever you wear it is <laughs> fine. Um, but a rise in watches in around 1675, Galileo Galilei was uh, on that train, <laughs> you know, uh, involved in studying the pendulum. Um, and so this, this, is, this is the era that Bach was, was living in. Um, and, we, and we can feel that sense of the clock and the pendulum <laughs> Um, in so much of his music, but yet there are other pieces which, at least to me, seem to only come to life when we remove the clock, <laughs> as it were. Um, not completely, but allow ourselves a more open field in which to play and to listen. <laughs> and this is just uh, absolutely music of uh, supernatural power, transcendental, sublime, cosmic, experience of ultimate innerness. It's so beautiful and you really need spaciousness. I talked in these, um, the C major prelude, the previous video, which has lots of tied notes uh, and so does this fugue, um, how you can wait a little bit after a, t after a long tied note before you play the next note after it to, as, a, as a way to give space. And uh, anyhow, I'm just going to dive in here. This fugue does remind me of some of the, um, the motets, Renaissance motets. Um, there were some that I, that I played recently by Orlando di Lasso, uh, who was obviously from before Bach's time, um, from the Renaissance, um, Flemish composers. And uh, I mean, this, this just to me is so reminiscent of that. As our moments in Art of Fugue, Bach's last work. So this is, this is all late Bach. Now let's just dive in with some singing and I'll see if I can conjure some of these gems off the page for you. Bass. from the universe. If you blow over it, that magic moment is shot to bits. Take time. Oh. It's 
stop there and be quite content. Oh, but there's more. Alto.
break in the sound. That was intense. We need to catch our breath. Uh, uh, tenor here. This is 35. <laughs> spotlight for two two uh, round trips around the track with this little motive um, <laughs> of where I'd like to switch to another voice. So it's not the same voice has it all three times. It gets it two times, and then you voice in a different voice. Bring out a different voice. Uh, middle of 38, my tenor. A second time. I'm going to switch maybe to the alto. stepwise fashion against the bass. It's just parallel thirds. Nice resonant full sound here. And maybe alto. that I'm most feeling the, the need to bring out. And it comes from having played each voice by itself several times and then playing two voices together and then a different pairing of two voices and just taking note. When you find something you like, uh, circle it, write it down. I already mentioned I have some big hearts <laughs> over passages in this piece. Um, sometimes in Bach, not on this piece, but uh, sometimes I'll put a happy face or I'll, I'll put like a, a shocked happy face with a, and I'll, and I'll even write Mr. B with an exclamation point because maybe there's a chromatic line that is kind of bizarre and shocking. Like how, how you know, <laughs> it kind of gives me a little bit of a chuckle as I'm playing. Um, the other thing I need to mention too is that this uh, subject gets, um, gets uh, squeezed a little bit. So in its present state, its original state at the beginning, one and two, that's it. Whole notes and half notes. In some places, we get what's called diminution, where the, the subject is kind of squeezed, like it, it's the same, same, uh, same shape, but fitting in a, like a, like a mini size, like you go for your French fries, you, you don't want the extra large, you don't want the small, you want the medium, maybe. <laughs> well, like the subject here is uh, with the whole and half notes, it's kind of like the large version, but we got a little like medium version of it uh, with the diminution, a couple of those. Where it's moving in quarter notes instead of half notes and whole notes. Uh, This was uh, soprano in 27, uh, tenor in 28, bass 28, 29. It happens a few more times, 30 in the bass. Um, there's also quite a few strattos in this fugue. And that is simply where 
um, we get a statement of the subject and before it has finished another voice has entered with its statement of the subject so it creates this like dovetailing and overlapping we get one uh, let's see um, where I just was actually with those dim diminution those small medium <laughs> squished versions uh, let's see let's take it uh, end of 27 here's a, a diminution version of the subject in the soprano same bar. So they're both um, almost piggybacking and that creates uh, somehow f a feeling of urgency, like calm urgency. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, and uh, urgent in that the voices are keen to contribute to the conversation and, and maybe they're just so excited they can't contain themselves. Um, it's, it's a lovely effect, certainly. Yeah, I mentioned uh, the motets of Orlando di Lasso, um, a Renaissance composer. This, this fugue reminds me of, of those in their spaciousness, clocklessness, almost. <laughs> uh, the last movement of Art of Fugue, Contrapunctus 14, Bach's final thing he wrote. Uh, this reminds me a little bit of that. The Siegfried Idol um, of Wagner, um, which Glenn Gould wrote, or rather, arranged for solo piano. Um, this, this resembles that. I actually have the Siegfried Idol by Glenn Gould here in my blue binder, and I've been on and off working on it, but um, we'll, we'll see if I ever get that plane off the ground. <laughs> um, but yeah, this idea of the clocks and time and mechanisms in, a, in so much of Bach's music, especially the pieces that the intermediate piano students learn. Um, but then there's this other side to his music, which for me is, is the more appealing, for sure. <laughs> and uh, just because it allows me escapism from my very seat. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I hope that was helpful. And thanks for watching. As always, I wish you happy practicing. Stay well, stay healthy, have a good summer, if it's even summer where you are. It could be winter where you are. <laughs> so I hope it's not too cold or too hot for you. These are difficult uh, times. You know, I before I wrap this up, I came across a quote that I wrote down a few months ago um, from uh, the Harvard Magazine, July, August 2020. So the pandemic was, uh, was on. <laughs> And this is uh, by Jacob Sweet. It's called One Small Step for Music. And he wrote, Humans generally don't do well with big issues like climate change that involve very slow changes over time. But music can help. It can help demonstrate that an event hundreds or thousands of years in the future is contingent on something happening now. And uh, that resonates with me in these spacious pieces of Bach. Anyhow, that's all I've got for you today. I, but I will be back again soon with some more performances of Bach's music practice and teaching tips, etc. And uh, until then, stay well. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>